Okay, study group, we're going to start this last chapter. This is chapter 11. I hope you guys can hear me okay. It is nighttime, so I'm trying to be a little bit quieter. I speak fairly loudly, let's just be honest. Um, but my voice is a little bit lower, so if you can barely hear me, just please turn me up, okay? So let's get through with chapter 11, and then everything else is up to you, okay? Once again, I have everything I need. I got my glasses, check. Binder, check. Water, check. Let's get done. All right, so this is chapter 11. So this is the last chapter that is in unit four, okay? And the first thing that we're gonna discuss is the goals for healthy people in 2030. Get comfortable guys okay so it reads as follows the goals for healthy people in 2030 we want the increased number of women older than 40 years of age to have mammograms to help uh, curb the rise in breast cancer also they're wanting an increased number of women uh, older than 21 years of age uh, to have their pap test to reduce the number of deaths that are due to cervical cancer. Also, in 2030, they're wanting to reduce occurrences of vertebral and hip fractures in older women who have osteoporosis and to reduce the occurrence of STDs or STIs, sexually transmitted diseases or sexually transmitted infections and pelvic inflammatory disease. In order for us to achieve these goals, we must require uh, preventative care, screening, and increased uh, accessibility to health care. So when we're talking about preventative care for women, um, when we're talking about preventative care for breast um, care, we're talking about teaching the patient how to perform breast self-examinations, which we call um, BSEs, and also teaching them the importance of mammograms, um, teaching vulvar self-examinations, which are BSEs, and pelvic examinations. With breast care, there are three different approaches for early uh, detection of breast cancer, and that is the monthly uh, breast self-exam, annual professional breast, breast examinations, and mammograms as appropriate for the person and her age. And when we're talking about vulva self-examinations, this begins at 18 years of age and it is to be performed monthly to identify lesions or any masses. Um, we instruct our patients to use a hand mirror to inspect systemically, palpate the vulva and the mons pubis. Okay, and if they notice any abnormalities, uh, we tell them to report it to their health care provider. When we talk about pelvic uh, exams, I know that this was a topic of uh, discussion in class, but for the sense of our book, we're talking about pelvic examinations, okay? Within that, we're talking about pap smears. They should start at 21 years uh, or older, regardless of sexual activity. They should have it every three years for women ages 21 to 29 years of age, every five years for women who are 30 to 65 years of age, and no screening is necessary for any women older than the age of 65 uh, years old with a negative screening for the past 10 years. Okay, so let's talk about uh, menstrual disorders a little bit. The common nursing role um, when we're discussing menstrual disorders, they include explaining any uh, recommended treatments, caring for the woman before and after uh, procedures, and provide emotional support, and that is for uh, menstrual disorders. We're talking about a woman who may be uh, experiencing uh, a, a menorrhea, and of course we know that that means the absence of menstruation. 
Um, this is normal before the menses starts. It's normal to have amenorrhea during uh, pregnancy. And it's also normal to have it after menopause. Those are the only times that it's normal to have an absence of your menstruation. Okay, now we categor categorize amenorrhea as primary or secondary. So what we're basically saying when we say primary or secondary is did it happen first and made other things happen or is she without a period because of something else? That would be considered secondary. And the treatment for amenorrhea depends on the cause that we can identify. Okay, so uh, abnormal uterine bleeding. There are three types of abnormal uterine bleeding. There is, um, let me see, uh, if the bleeding is too frequent, if the uh, duration is too long, and if it is an excessive amount. Common causes of abnormal uterine bleeding are pregnancy complications, lesions of the vagina, the cervix, or the uterus, breakthrough bleeding when a patient may be on contraceptives, endocrine disorders can cause it, or a failure to ovulate could cause abnormal uterine bleeding. So, um, we also have menstrual cycle pain. Um, so we have um, one cycle of pain that we call the Meltzimers. Meltzimers is pain that many women experience around ovulation and it's near the middle of their menstrual cycle. Then we have dysmenorrhea, and that is painful menses or uh, cramps. If we label it as primary, there's no evidence of pelvic abnormalities. If we label it as secondary, we're saying that a pathological condition is identified. If we're labeling it vasopressins and prostaglandins from the um, endometrium could contribute to her pain, or um, we could say that there's some uh, potent stimulants of uh, painful uterine contractions. So those are the only four things that we're looking for when we're talking about painful menses or cramping. Now when we're talking about pain, women who um, suffer from um, different types of uterine abnormalities, they can experience a lot of pain. So one of the things that you are um, looking to do for that patient is always try to control the pain. Help them control their pain, okay? Uh, let's talk about another thing that's painful for some of our uh, female patients, and that is endometriosis. And that is the presence of tissue that resembles the endometrium, but it is located outside of the uterus. And it can cause pain, pressure, and inflammation. And it is more constant than uh, spasmatic, okay? It can cause painful um, sexual intercourse. It can cause pain when she's on her cycle. It can cause pain when she's not on her cycle as well. Um, Premenstrual dysmorphic disorder, which we call PMDD, that used to be referred to as PMS, 
Um, it was formerly called PMS, which we called premenstrual syndrome. It is associated with abnormal um, serotonin responses to normal changes in the estrogen level. And the symptoms occur between ovulation and the onset of menstruation. And it is not present, um, they are not present the week after menstruation has occurred. I always like to throw that in because some people think that they can claim PMS all month or all cycle long. So let me look here because I wrote a little question down about PMS that I would like to discuss with you guys to help drive that home just a little bit. Got to get to the very back here. Okay. Oh, I know what it was. So, um, in your book, it kind of tells you what we can do, what we could teach our patients to do to help alleviate some of the symptoms of um, PMDD, used to be known as PMS, and one of it, one of them was diet control, okay? So, a diet that is very well noted, uh, and some statistics have been done on it, that will alleviate some of the symptoms for our young ladies or diets that are high in carbohydrates and high in fiber. So diets that are high in carbohydrates and high in fiber um, can decrease the, um, sorry, it can decrease the uh, effects of PMDD, okay? Let's keep going, shall we? I'm looking here, there, everywhere. Because I'm nosy. Okay, so so some symptoms of, I'm sorry, symptoms and diagnoses uh, of PMDD are decreased mood. They may be lethargic. They can have anxiety or tension um, or feeling like they're just on edge. Change in appetite change in the sleeping habits, feeling of uh, being overwhelmed, increased sensitivity to uh, rejection, irritability. They can uh, have some physical symptoms like breast tenderness, bloating, weight gain, uh, headaches. They can have difficulty in concentrating and decrease uh, interest in their normal, you know, usual activities. Okay. We're working right on through this, guys. Let's go. So, let's talk about factors that can change normal floor of the vagina. Antibiotics can change the normal floor of the vagina. It encourages youth overgrowth. You. Sorry. Yeast overgrowth. <laughs> I crack myself up. Uh, douching, that can change the pH within the vagina. Sexual intercourse can actually raise the pH to seven or higher for up to about eight hours after. Uncontrolled diabetes also can change the normal flora because the high sugars promote growth of microorganisms. Those are all very common things that change the normal flora of the vagina. Um, and so when we're teaching our uh, patients how to prevent vaginal infections, okay, these are highlights, guys, okay, just to get you back on the same page with me, these are highlights. Um, we teach the woman to wear cotton underwear Avoid tight nylon and spandex pants, which are very popular right now. So we educate on that a lot. We like to teach people to wipe from front to back. Frequent hand hygiene, a high fiber, uh, low fat diet, 
exercise and to avoid douching and using uh, internal feminine hygiene products that would help prevent vaginal infection okay Now let's talk about the nurse's role when we're talking about uh, gynecological infections. It's the nurse's role to educate the women concerning their vaginal health, to teach them preventions of STIs, identifying uh, patients that may have high-risk behaviors, um, teach them safe sex practices, teach them um, to reduce the number of sexual partners, in avoiding exchanging of bodily fluids. And also, we like to provide non-judgmental um, and sensitive counseling when it comes to our patients, um, simply because it's not our role to judge, period, anybody. But when a nurse um, judges, then sometimes the patients will not um, take heed to what you're saying because it just kind of seems like it may be a little bit preachy or judgy or however, whatever the term is you want to use with that. Um, but what we want our patients to do is come to us, talk to us, listen to us, try to um, follow our directions. And so we want them to feel comfortable coming to us and talking to us. And the best way to do that is to be very open and non-judgmental. So now let's talk about toxic shock syndrome. I know in class we had a couple of really um, good examples of people uh, that may have gone into toxic shock or close to it. Um, you know, so there are some great examples in class. I love it when you guys share. It helps people remember certain things, okay? So toxic shock syndrome, which we call TSS, is usually caused by strands of um, staphylococcus the Coca RS, uh, and it's toxins that can produce shock, uh, coagulation defects, and tissue damage if they enter into the bloodstream. It usually results from the trapping of bacteria in the reproductive tract uh, for a prolonged period of time. Sometimes that can happen when a patient may use a high absorb, uh, absorbent um, tampon and or if they use a diaphragm or cervical caps for contraception that they do not remove that they forget to remove um, things like that signs and symptoms of tss which is toxic shock syndrome is a sudden spiking of fever flu-like symptoms, uh, hypotension, um, generalized rash that could resemble a sunburn, skin peeling from the palms of the hands and soles of the feet after one or two weeks of the illness. Some things that we could teach our patients to do to prevent TSS are hand hygiene, changing tampons at least every four hours. Um, do not use super absorbent tampons. Use peri pads rather than tampons when sleeping. Do not use a diaphragm or a cervical cap during the menstrual period. And to remove diaphragms um, or cervical caps as recommended by their healthcare provider. Okay, so let's move on. Let's keep going and move on to uh, types of sexually transmitted diseases or sexually transmitted infections. We have the fungal uh, or bacterial type, and then we also have the viral type. Okay, so let's start with the uh, bacterial or fungal. So that is um, candidas. Trichomonas, bacterial vaginosis, chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, and PID, which is known as pelvic inflammatory disease. Now, the viral STIs are 
herpes simplex viruses, human papillomia virus, hepatitis B, HIV, or AIDS. These infections uh, can be spread by sexual contact, although some have other modes of transmission as well. So we're going to move on from that and we're going to go to family planning and nursing role highlights for our study group. So with family planning, uh, your role as the nurse is to answer any general questions concerning contraceptive modes, explain different uh, methods available, you should explain the advantages and the disadvantages, and teaching correct use of uh, contraceptive methods for your patient. Let's look here. I have made myself another little treasure note for you guys. Oh, okay. So when we're talking to a patient about um, birth control, um, we must still add, even though. Uh, a lot of people just want to know about all the different chemical, you know, ways of uh, birth control, or they want to know some of the more natural ways um, that they can control if they become pregnant or not. As a nurse, you always discuss abstinence as being the only uh, birth control that is 100% effective. And it is the only birth control that can guarantee that the patient will not um, get an STI, okay? So if you're teaching a class, if you're teaching a school of high schoolers, now they're even starting much earlier than that, you know, with the sex ed classes, of course. Uh, but we like to teach them that abstinence is the only 100% way to remain free of pregnancy and free of um, any STIs. Okay, so factors that could influence the choice of contraceptive methods. Um, age is one. Um, health status um, is another. Religion or culture could uh, influence someone's choice, their frequency in, in um, sexual activity. Uh, convenience and the degree of spontaneity uh, that they desire, impact of unplanned pregnancy on the woman or, the, or her family would influence the choice. Expense of the contraceptive could influence the choice. Number of sexual partners or desire for children in the future. All of these things could uh, play in on the how or why a patient would choose a type of contraceptive method. So, for instance, um, question, if we have a new mom and she um, is a breastfeeding mom, she may be concerned about her birth control method. If she's a breastfeeding mom, for one, like I have told you guys several times, we will educate her that breastfeeding is not birth control. It's not. Um, but we would like for her to establish her breastfeeding well before um, getting on to, like, back onto the pill. So if this mom was taking a... Um, the pill for birth control. If she asks, you know, can I resume taking the pill? You know, even though I'm breastfeeding, your answer to her is, yes, you can. Okay, but we need to make sure that you are in a very good pattern of breastfeeding um, before you get onto the pill. Okay, so she may want to use um, condoms or something like that. Um, while she's still trying to get into her 
breastfeeding, um, what's the word I want to use, into the rhythm of breastfeeding very well, okay? So that she can establish her milk and things like that first. Okay, but we do have some patients who want to do the natural uh, family planning. We also call this a uh, fertility awareness, okay? So natural family planning is also called fertility awareness. Um, it involves learning the uh, identity um, and learning to identify signs and symptoms associated with ovulation. Um, this plan is acceptable to most religions and it requires no uh, administration of medication or any uses of devices. And the natural planning is reversible, but it does have a 20% failure rate, okay? So uh, the types of natural pl uh, family planning, we teach the moms about uh, basal body temperature, cervical mucus, calendar or rhythm methods, and the Marquette method, okay? But I wanna talk a little bit about the basal body temperature method. I want you guys to make sure that you look that up in your uh, book as well. But I'm going to pose a question to you. So if you have a patient who on day 13, pay attention, day 13, of a 28-day cycle, the woman's body temperature is about 97.7 Fahrenheit. Um, if she is going to be with an ovulation on the 14th day, her temperature measurement would be uh, 98.1. Okay, so please make sure that you look at that basal temperature chart in your book so that you can kind of understand it. I just told you what it was and what's the difference going to be on the temperature of that day. But I want you to make sure that you go back and read that for full understanding, okay? But this is just a little cliff note version. Okay, so also when it comes to cervical mucus, I want you guys to remember that um, cervical mucus, um, when it's thin, it is there to enhance the mobility of sperm. So if you have a patient who has wanted to check her cervical mucus and she reports that the cervical mucus is thin, okay, and clear, then that is how we can explain to her, okay, this is when you'll know that the mobility of the sperm will be great at this time, okay? Let's keep going. I was about to get into a long thought process about what I was about to teach y'all about something else, but this is the Cliff Notes, Miss Williams. This is the Cliff Notes. Okay, so let's talk about temporary contraception. Oh, hormonal contraceptions. That's a form of a temporary birth control. It prevents ovulation. It makes the cervical mucus thick and resistant to sperm penetration, okay? And it makes the uterine endometrium less hospitable if the fertilized ovum arrives, okay? So that was that's what happens when we use hormonal contraception. Oh my gosh. And hormonal contraception does not protect um, our patients from STIs, and it also does not protect our patients against HIV. And we like to uh, explain that to them um, just so that they will know, okay? Hormonal contraceptions are things like 
the um, um, implants, injections, transdermal patches, vaginal rings, um, anything that will delay menstruation. I'm sorry that my phone is going off, guys. I'm going to ignore it. I hope that you'll ignore it too, okay? Never stops. Never stops. Okay. So, let's also talk about um, Archie's, okay? It is the warning signs that we tell our patients to report when they're taking oral contraception. And Archie's, the A stands for abdominal pain that may be severe. It is an acronym. I know that you guys know that, but I'm going to break down the acronym of ARCHES, okay? A is for abdominal pain, which is severe. C is for chest pain, dyspnea, or bloody sputum. H is for headaches that may be severe, uh, weakness, or numbness of the extremities. E is for eye problems. And S is for severe leg pain or swelling or speech disturbances, okay? We tell our patients, call the physician immediately if they have any of those problems, okay? Now, when we're talking about oral contraceptions, we also like to teach our patients that there are some medications that she can take, that she may be prescribed, that will decrease the effectiveness of her contraception, um, like antibiotics, uh, anticonvulsants, um, barbiturates, um, and when I say the antibiotics, I'm talking about uh, antimicrobials, okay, such as ampicillin or tetracycline, okay. There are some antibiotics that the physicians can give that will not hinder birth control, okay. So we're talking about antimicrobials, okay. So we also would like to teach our patients about barrier contraception. Barrier contraceptions are things like diaphragms, cervical caps, uh, condoms, uh, male or female, and spermicides. We also um, like to continue this by talking about emergency contraceptives, like the morning after pill. Uh, that is a method to preventing pregnancy. Um, such as the Plan B, um, and this must be taken no later than 72 hours after um, protected sexual intercourse, and it they may need to be um, and may need to be repeated 12 hours after the first pill. But this depends on the type of pills that they uh, purchase. Okay, so they must read the directions um, and follow the directions of the medication. Now, since we're talking about contraceptives, we're gonna talk about some of these myths, okay? Are these false or fake, um, unreliable contraceptive methods, like withdrawal, I've delivered a ton of those babies, um, uh, douching, breastfeeding, those are not um, birth control methods, okay? Okay, so now let's talk about permanent contraception for people who may know that they're done having kids, do not choose to have any more children. Um, we could have, uh, for the male, we will do a sterilization per a uh, vasectomy. Or for a female, she may have a sterilization through a tubal ligation or a to, uh, Hysterostoscopic, hysteroscopic um, sterilization. I hate saying that. I want to say hysterectomy with a scope for sterilization. But that's not really what it's called. 
It is done with the scope though. Oh, let's talk about uh, menopause. Okay, so, oh, you guys, this is our last little bit. Okay, so let's talk about menopause. Um, menopause is actually described as the cessation of the menstrual cycle for 12 months. Okay, so they must be free of a period for 12 months. Um, and they will be free of the period because of a decreased uh, estrogen production. All right. But it cannot be, oh, I, I missed my period for one month, four months, six months now. Or, you know, she spotted for 12 months. That means she's, you know, in menopause. No. Period free for 12 months equals menopause. Uh, pregnancy can still occur. Um, at a very short stage of menopause, which is called the climacteric stage, and that is the change of life. It is also known as the perimenopausal period, which is about, uh, which is two to eight years before menstruation really ceases, okay? The pregnancy can still occur during this time period. This is sometimes when the woman may think that she is, you know, um, going through the change, you know, because she may not be having her cycle as regularly and things like that, but she is not menopausal until she's 12 months free of her period. Some physical changes that women will notice when they're going through menopause is usually caused by a decrease in estrogen. Changes in her menstrual cycle Vasomotor instability, which is known as her hot flashes. Decrease in elasticity and moisture of her vagina. She may have a pain while having sex. Some may notice changes in the uh, libido, like they may have um, changes there in their sexual desire. Uh, breast atrophy or a loss of productive effects of her estrogen on the cardiovascular and her skeletal system. Some psychological and cultural variations that we note with women who are going through menopause, it can threaten their feelings of health and self-worth. Um, some may feel liberated from monthly periods and others may feel the end is near of unwanted pregnancies. There's some treatment options that um, we like to educate our menopausal um, patients on. It is exercise. We teach them to increase the calcium, magnesium, and um, fiber, which we really want high fiber in their diet. Hormone replacement therapy, which is also known as HRT. This may increase the risk of a heart attack and stroke. It is based on individual patients and that is always discussed with their healthcare provider. And the healthcare provider likes to weigh the pros versus the cons with giving any HRT. Um, we also teach complementary and uh, alternative therapies and prevention of osteoporosis for these patients. Our nursing care for our patients are not limited to, but involve determining whether the woman understand the risk of uh, HRT and the benefits of HRT. We teach the signs and symptoms for them to report, like vaginal bleeding, that recurs after cessation of her menses, vaginal irritation, um, or signs of UTIs. We also teach the woman how to take prescribed medications correctly um, and to report specific side effects that she might know. 
and we teach her the value of weight bearing exercises in order to help her bones and um, things like that during her menopausal state. I know you guys are like, oh my gosh, Miss Williams, what are you looking at? I was looking at my book. Was you looking at your book? Was you reading at your notes? Well, I hope that you were. So guys, this is the conclusion of chapter 11. I hope that um, doing these little study groups are helpful since we decided to do them a little bit later um, in our semester. So we're kind of starting them a little bit late. Let's stay on it. Let's listen to them. Turn them on in your car. Listen to them as you drive. Do whatever it is that you have to do um, in order to stay on top of maternity. Okay? It's been a pleasure doing them for you. I will do chapter five. I'm sorry, unit five as well. But I'll start now. Okay? Have a good night. See y'all in the morning. Bye.